I am sure that you have heard many times expressions such as the sky is the limit or they're pushing the limits of technology very far. And of course that's one use of the word limit, but in the context of calculus limit has a very specific meaning and that's what we're going to be exploring in this class. In particular we're going to be looking at the concept of limit and not so much the computations. So let's have a look at what that is. In the context of calculus, the limit is the fundamental tool. Every other tool, every other technique that you're going to learn uh, within the context of calculus is based on limits. And therefore, it's very important for you to understand what limits are very, very clearly and very carefully. In particular, it is important to understand what the meaning of a limit is because of course the algebraic manipulations which are involved in computing limits are very important but not as much as understanding what it is that we're trying to do with a limit. And even more specifically you want to make sure that you're not going to fall prey to some common misconceptions which are very common yes but also very wrong and can influence negatively your understanding of limits. Let's start from one motivating problem that leads us to want to define and analyze limits, which is of course very much connected with the, with the core of calculus. And the uh, problem is the following. Let's say that we have a nice function like this one, okay, just a regular function f of x, and let's pick a point on this function. So let's say that the x coordinate of this point is c, and its y coordinate of course is going to be f of c. All right, now let's pick another point somewhere else. Just pick one. There, that's good. So this point will have x coordinate x, and correspondingly, its y coordinate is going to be f of x. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the slope between these two points. That is, of course, the slope of the line that joins those two points. There is only one such line. Let's compute its slope. I'm fairly confident that you know that in order to compute this slope we compute the rise and then we compute the run and then for the slope we compute the ratio of rise over run. And also in this particular situation the rise will be the change or the difference in height in the y coordinates between our point, our original point, the green one, and the new one that we picked, the blue one. So that means that the rise is going to be f of x minus f of c, the difference between the two y coordinates, and the run is going to be the difference between the two corresponding x coordinates. So far so good, it's really not a problem, it's something you can do probably in your sleep. And in fact, you can do it no matter what point you pick on this function. So I can pick this other point higher up, or I can even pick a point on the other side, can do the same thing. Notice that anytime I pick another point, I can draw the line, I can compute the, uh, that fraction very, very easily. And I can do that even if the second point I'm picking is very, very close to the original one. Not a problem at all. Now let's do a very slight change which however is going to create a very major problem for us. Namely, what we're going to do is we're going to ask what is the slope at the point? You can think of this function as the contour of some kind of a mountain and you can tell that there is a slope at the point. If you were walking on that mountain you can tell that there is a slope, right? You're going up left to right. So, can we compute the slope at that point? Well, if we use the same approach that we've used so far using the slope formula that we have, that creates a problem because that would tell us that we have to compute f of c minus f of c divided by c minus c. Oh, that's a bit of a problem because it's 0 over 0, which is something that we cannot compute. So, in fact, by asking for the slope at the point we have a major problem and yet we can see that this slope should exist. I mean there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to compute it. It's there, you can see it, right? So how are we going to compute it? That is the motivating problem that comes from slopes. The problem related to limits can actually be phrased in terms of just functions and it is the following. Many functions have some special x values where something unusual happens. For instance, let's have a look at this function, x cubed minus 2x minus 4, all divided by 2x minus 4. If, if you put that function in your graphing calculator, this is the graph that you will see, right? Very nice function. But do you notice something strange about this function? What happens when x is equal to 2? 
algebraically you can see that if you put x equal to in the function the denominator becomes zero and we have a problem because of course as we well know we cannot divide by zero and if you look very carefully on the graph you'll notice that there is a little bit of a what a gap a hole well that is exactly what we want to find out what is happening at that particular point to see the problem associated with limits in general for functions even better, consider these three functions. Uh, notice they're very simple functions and they have something in common. They're all undefined at x equals zero. And if you think about it, x equals zero is the only value for which any one of these three functions is in fact undefined. Everywhere else we can compute the function, no problem. But for x equals zero, we do have a problem. And yet let's look at the graphs of these three functions. If you look at the graph of 1 over x, it looks like this. Now let's see what happens if we try to scan this function left to right going through this value x equals 0. What happens? Well, our point is trying to go through 0, but it can't. It gets pushed down, gets pushed down, eventually disappears, and then maybe pops up on the other side, and we're not quite sure what is going on as the function crosses through zero. Now you can tell me well it's going to infinity but yeah that's exactly what we need to find out. Is it? Or is something else more strange more interesting happening? Now let's look at the second one sine x over x. This is what the graph looks like and as we try to go through x equals zero it looks like what well, looks like what? Let's look at that again. Well it looks like not much is happening is it? Okay, It looks like there is no problem x equals zero and yet we know we can't compute it. Let's look at the third example. For this one, what happens as, this is by the way the graph that you will get, or maybe a small variation of it, you may want to try and graph this function, your graphing calculator, you'll notice something interesting, because your calculator doesn't know much calculus. It tries to do it, but it's not very good at it. So the graph that you'll get is probably not correct. But as you try to scan this function, what happens? Well, from the left hand side, it goes nicely, and then poof, jumps to the other side. So three functions, all three with uh, the same problem at zero, but three very different behaviors. So what we're going to look at with limits is exactly what's going on there and how can we figure out what exactly is going on. Now let's focus uh, for a few minutes on the notation and let's clarify what it actually means. Now, so what it means is given a function f of x, that's what your function is in there, that's the role of that f of x in there, so we have to be given this function. And we have a special value c, a special, well, sometimes it's going to be a number, we're going to see sometimes it's not going to be a number, but we'll uh, worry about that later. What we're doing is we're going to ask a question. What happens? That's what that LIM stands for. Well, we're going to pronounce it limit, but what we're really asking is what is happening? What is happening to what? What is happening to the y value, which of course is represented by the function, as the x value does what? Well, gets closer and closer to c, and that's what that arrow represents. So that's the notation for you. Remember, what we're asking with this notation is what's going on with the y value for this function as x is approaching this special value of c. Having seen that the notation limit as x approaches c of f of x represents really a question, what we want to do is come up with an answer. So what is the limit as x approaches c of f of x? That is, what is happening to the y coordinate as the x coordinate is getting closer and closer to c? Mathematicians, of course, always need a very formal, a very precise way of uh, defining things and computing things and so on. And the precise formal definition of limit can be a very uh, complex, very intricate uh, matter. You can find it in any standard calculus book. Uh, but here I'm going to try and give you more of a visual um, idea of what the de this definition entails. So I'm going to start from a way which is actually pretty accurate of describing what a limit is in terms of uh, what is the answer to the question. And then I'm going to try to explain it to you uh, visually. So let's see. Given a value c on our function, then if there is a number l, which is going to be, of course, a y value, such that we can make the difference between f of x and l less than any small number by making the difference between x and c small enough, then we're going to say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is actually going to be this number l. 
you can tell that even though this is a simplified version of the formal definition, it's still quite messy. So what are we talking about? So let's pick a point on our function and let's identify its x coordinate by the vertical line here and its y coordinate by the horizontal line. If we do that, then the distance between the horizontal line and the value L is this absolute value of f of x minus L that I was mentioning earlier. So that amount there, we want to make as small as possible because we want L to be the limit. So we want the function to get closer and closer to it. So we want that quantity to become as small as we want. And so what we're saying is that we can do that by using the, the horizontal distance between the x value and and the value c, which is the absolute value of x minus c, and we can make that one small enough. So what we're saying is that l is going to be the limit of the function as x approaches c. If I can make that vertical distance as small as I want by making the horizontal dis distance small enough. So this little animation tells you what's happening. Notice that I'm moving to the right hand side, I'm moving towards C, and consequently the vertical line is approaching L, it's getting closer and closer to L. And in fact I can make f of x as close to L as I want by making x close enough to C. That's what the definition is saying. And of course that should be doable both from the left hand side and the right hand side. So I can approach this thing from the right hand side and still get the same result. So this is a little bit closer to the formal definition of limit, again as close as we're going to get, but it gives you hopefully a very good idea of what we're doing. There is a common misunderstanding that uh, beginner students uh, have, and I hope you don't, but just in case I'm going to quickly go over that. And the question is, isn't the limit as x approaches c of f of x just equal to f of c? Now it may look like it, because quite often at the beginning when we give you some basic simple examples of limits, um, quite often th those two really coincide. And in fact, it often does happen, but not always. So what is the difference and where is it? Let's have a look at our um, example that we've already seen. So this is uh, the function whose graph you see there. And remember that what we're looking at is the limit as x approaches 2 because there was something strange going on at 2. So generally speaking, f at c is the value of the function at the given value. In this case, what we will be looking at is there, but f of 2 does not exist. Remember, for this particular function, we cannot even compute f of 2. The denominator becomes 0. So in this case, the value of the function does not exist. On the other hand, the limit as x approaches c of f of x means that we're looking at the values of the function near the value, not at the value, but near the value. And in this case, actually, as we're going to see soon, as you probably have already guessed, uh, the limit of this particular function as x approaches 2 is 5. So in this case, the limit exists, not the function. So the two are usually the same, and we're going to analyze this concept, this um, equality, more in detail when we talk about continuity. But in the situations in which, in fact, we end up computing the limit, those two are probably not going to be the same. So always distinguish between the value of a function at a given value and the value of that function near the value, which is what gives the limit. So when is it worthwhile to actually compute limits? If in fact, as I said, the limit and the function are really the same often, but not always, when is it worthwhile to compute the limit instead of just computing the function? Well, a limit can be analyzed at any value, but is only useful at some values where something interesting occurs. Well, I know you could have read that yourself, but I had some fun reading it myself. All right, so for instance, for this particular function, uh, it's still the same function that we're dealing with, we could compute the limit as x approaches 0, right? But nothing much is happening at 0. I can compute easily the function for x equals 0, nothing goes wrong, and there is no graphical feature that I can even see, right? So I can compute the limit, turns out that that limit is simply 1, and the thing is pretty boring. And the same, the same thing happens, say, at x equals negative 3. Yeah, I can consider the limit as x approaches negative 3, but nothing is going on at negative 3. This is again pretty boring, and it turns out to be 2.5. So where is it interesting? That's where it is interesting, at x equal 2, right? Because that's the situation where we're not quite sure what happens. There is a hole in the graph. The function cannot be computed. We're not quite sure if actually we have a single point hole or we have a whole
whole gap, we have to watch out. So those are the situations where computing a limit is in fact useful. You may remember the original uh, motivating example where we had a slope that we could not be computed only when we asked for the slope at a point. As long as we considered a second point, that was fine. It was only when the second point ended up being the same as the first point that we had troubles. So it's only these special values that computing limits really make sense. In the definition that we have seen of limit, we were assuming that the function was approaching this value L from, from both sides, right? But in some situations, it is uh, useful to consider what happens to the function when x approaches c from one side only. So for instance, we can approach from the left hand side only. We can take our point, start from the left of the given uh, value c, and then move it towards the value c that we're considering. In that case, the notation is going to be the limit as x approaches c with a little minus on the top right side, almost looking like an exponent, and that means from the left. So the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x is going to be equal to l. Okay? Uh, in this particular case, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left hand side is equal to 5. Notice, by the way, I'm not using the same function as before. I'm using a piecewise function with two different separate pieces. Okay? Now, we can also look at the limits of coming from the right hand side. Again, we start from the right of the given value and we approach it from the right hand side, moving towards the left until we reach something or not. We'll have to figure it out. In this situation, we say that we're computing the limit as x approaches c from the right hand side, indicated by a little plus. And again, if there is a number that satisfies the given property from the right hand side, we're going to call that the right hand limit. So in this particular situation, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right hand side would be actually 6. So in this situation, we have two separate limits, one from the left and one from the right. So obviously, this function does not have a limit at c because it's not going to the same place. However, when, in fact, the limit exists, then the left and the right side coincide, and you can actually check that the other way around works as well. If both the left and the right limit exist and are the same, then the limit itself exists. Now, there are some situations where the limit does not exist, and yet we can say something quite interesting as well. For instance, let's look at this particular function. And let's say that we are interested in finding out what is actually happening to this function near x equals 0. So we can ask, well, what is the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x? Well, you look at the graph or you look at the formula and you realize that as x is getting smaller and smaller, the y coordinate is not approaching anything in particular. So the correct answer here would be that this, this limit does not exist, often abbreviated as DNE. But we can say more. We know why it does not exist. There is a very special reason why the limit does not exist, namely that the function is becoming huge. The values of y are becoming big without any bound. So, in this situation, if f of x grows without bounds when x is approaching c, then we have some special notation and some special terminology. Then we're going to say, if we're looking at the left hand side, that the limit as x approaches c from the left of our function in a situation like this will be plus or minus infinity. So what that means is, once again, that as x is approaching c from the left, the function, the value of the function, the y-coordinate, is becoming huge, either in positive values or in negative values. Of course, in each case, we'll have to specify whether it's positive infinity or negative infinity we're talking about. And obviously, we can do exactly the same thing on the right-hand side. So if that's what happens on the right-hand side as well, we'll say that the right limit will be plus or minus infinity. By the way, you cannot write plus or minus infinity as an answer. Well, this is just a shorthand notation, one that you may want to uh, get used to because it is sometimes uh, used, but it has to be either positive infinity or negative infinity, not both of them at the same time. It has to go somewhere. So for instance, in our case, for this particular function 1 over x, if we look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the left hand side, we can see that the function is going down all the way to negative infinity, meaning that the y values are becoming huge in negative values without any bound. Similarly, if we look at the right hand side, if we look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, we can see that the function is actually going up. It's increasing and the y values can become as big as we want no bounds. 
So we say that in that case we're talking about the limit being infinite. So in both of these cases we talk about infinite limits. It's the limit itself that is infinite. Now there is something else linking limits and infinity and those are limits at infinity. What is the question here? We're looking at the same function as before but we're going to ask a slightly different question and the question is what happens to f of x when x becomes large without bounds? So for instance uh, as x is going to the right hand side and going and going and going and gone uh, what happens to the y values? What's going on in that kind of situation? So as x is becoming huge without any bounds then what happens to y? In this case we're looking at the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. Similarly we can go on the other side. We can take the left hand side and go to the left and oh who knows it may go up and down and change and who knows what's happening. But in that situation what we're asking is what's happening at, uh, to the function as x goes to negative infinity. So these are called limits at infinity. They are very much related to graphs and to asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes so we're going to review them in more detail at that time. At this, for now, just focus on the question what these limits at infinity are actually asking and uh, make sure you understand now all the basic concepts regarding the meaning and the notation of these limits.